meet all of you, and thank you for all coming out tonight. Um, I first term it, as Ms. Davis so gloriously said. Um, I'm helping out with uh, the Russian enrichment program. I'm the president of the Russian club. Um, and Dr. Reese has taught a graduate and undergraduate courses in European, Soviet, and modern military history at Texas A&M since the 1990s. Um, his research his specialty is social history in the Soviet Red Army and as well as the Imperial Russian Army. And he has authored in numerous articles and book chapters as well as five books on the Russian Army. Um, Stalin's Reluctant Soldiers, The Soviet Military Experience, Red Commanders, Why Stalin Soldiers Fought, and The Imperial Russian Army in Peace, War, and Revolution. Um, following this presentation, we'll have a short question and answer section. So if you have any questions, please um, keep them in mind and we'll ask them at the end. Um, thank you all for coming and enjoy the evening. Can I present Dr. You can see the title of the talk. Uh, the interwar period doesn't get a lot of attention. People, you hear about the revolution and then the civil war and then nothing until World War II. Okay. Um, and so I, I want to um, fill you in on that. So you actually come away from this understanding how World War II worked out um, a little more than you would have otherwise. And so I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to stick exactly to 1936. I'm going to have to talk a little bit about World War II to, to kind of wrap things up and actually to start things off. So um, here's what most people actually might have an inkling of. So uh, the German invasion of Soviet Union, called Operation Barbarossa, was um, June 19, June 22nd, 1941. And you can see by the black Nazi arrows there that uh, the Germans did pretty well, <laughs> uh, driving all the way, uh, uh, actually by uh, October, uh, to the gates of Moscow. Uh, and just look, so this is from, from June to, to October, they conquered pretty much all of Western Russia, the Ukraine, the Baltic States, Belarusia. Uh, pretty, it was just an absolute disaster for Soviet Union and the Red Army comes across looking pretty inept, pretty mismanaged, um, incapable, uh, incompetent, and um, just obviously not up to the task. Okay? And um, the talk today is, is really to explain, well, that's not a foregone conclusion. That is, in fact, up till through 1936, the Red Army actually really had their act together. Uh, if the Germans had tried to invade in 1936, there would have been a, you wouldn't have seen that disaster happen, I think. Okay. Um, so I'll actually close with well, what happened between 19, well, after 1936, 1941. I'll kind of wrap that up, which will refer back to like, here's what was going on, and why didn't that hold up? Why didn't the progress they had made and the capacity they had um, accumulated by the end of 1936, what happened to that? <laughs> what went wrong? Okay. Uh, so let's first, I want to, most of this lecture is about what went right. Okay. And in three areas of military endeavor, they got, they got it right uh, up till, through 1936. Actually, even till June of 37, we could even say that much. Okay. So uh, first thing is they actually got it right, they, how to prepare for war. They sat and well, actually had a lot of debates, a lot of really in, <coughs> serious intellectual work uh, on this topic and came to some very important rational conclusions and worked it. Worked it to prepare themselves for a massive modern war. <coughs> they got that right. Okay. They thought about how to fight that war. Not, not just how to prepare for it, but also how to fight it. You know, again, a lot of debates, intellectual exercises, uh, war gaming, things in their minds and, and in the war colleges and out in the battlefield or the, the maneuver fields. Um, and they came to a really workable, dynamic method of fighting the war or fighting a future war. So they got that right. Okay. And um, <clears throat> who they might fight. Right? Um, looking, looking down the road, like who might our enemies be how do we you know, focus our energies to defend or attack those particular enemies? And they got that right too. So th they had a great plan that they worked to prepare for war. They had great ideas how to fight a war. They organized that and they knew who they were gonna fight <laughs> and kind of had that lined up. Uh, but then obviously something goes wrong and we'll kind of wrap up with that. So let's talk about what they got right, how they got right. But actually let's go back to 19, 1918. So come back up a little bit here. Um, okay. uh, 
it's, it's, I'm going to talk about those guys. Okay, so first of all, the, looking at the, the Bolshevik Party before and during the revolution and the, in the immediate years of the Civil War, uh, you have to appreciate that the military, the, particularly the, the, the new military that the Bolsheviks are using or are, are creating, uh, they had a lot against them. Okay. That is, the Bolshevik Party before the war, based on their Marxist ideology, really didn't want to have an army. They thought, uh, and this is actually straight Marxism, that um, they're anti militarist, anti military establishments, militaries are bad, they're used to oppress the people. <coughs> so if they ever took power somewhere, they would not have an army. And they actually brought that with them to the revolution and thought they could do that. We're not going to have an army. <laughs> uh, Lenin and Trotsky and Stalin, all those guys were, uh, yeah, that's, that's the right ideological thing, not to have an army. Well, they took over the country in the middle of a World War I, so <laughs> they kind of have to have an army then. Okay, but we'll get rid of it afterwards. Well, they got out of World War I, left leaving democracy in the lurch on that one in 1918. And, they, and so, they, again, the ideologues come up and say, well, okay, we can get rid of the army now. Just dismantle the whole old arm, uh, uh, imperial army and get on with just being a, a peaceful country. Well, they immediately, seriously, within days of getting out of World War I, start, civil war starts. Right? All the people in Russia who don't want the Bolsheviks to be in charge. Well, got to have an army to defend their power, to create power and take over the Soviet Union. So they, okay, well, for now, we'll have an army, okay? But when this is over, we'll get rid of that, okay? But meanwhile, there's always a bunch of guys, Bolsheviks and old officers from, well, officers from the old army who want to stay in the army and work for the Bolsheviks, who, they're not buying into that. It's like, no, we're going to need an army long term because that's just real life, okay? And so there was a debate already, always brewing, it's like, Get rid of the army, it's not politically correct. It's like, you're idiots, <laughs> we gotta have an army. Um, and so they have those debates in 1918, 1921. Finally, the Civil War's over in, in 1921 and, and they get, they're back at it, debating these things, not have an army, have an army. Uh, and they finally did compromise. Well, uh, uh, when, when the, the ideologues realized that it probably is unrealistic to not have an army at all, uh, they came up with the idea of a citizen's militia army, which is really like uh, a National Guard. And that's all they would have. Everyone uh, would be part-time soldiers and all across the Soviet Union, and they wouldn't have a standing regular army, but they'd call up the, the territorial militia, as they called it, if, if a war happens. <laughs> like, oh, we're being invaded, we better you know, organize ourselves and get busy, that kind of thinking. So finally in 1923, and of course, the, the guys who, who want to have a real army, they're like, oh, no, that's not going to work. We need to have a real standing army all the time. But finally, and this is in the Communist Party. They're just debating these things. And it gets really kind of ugly at times as part of the power plays between people. Finally, in 1923, they do agree we're going to have, they're going to have a standing army, a real army full time um, based on conscription. Uh, and with a, an officer corps to, to lead it. We'll have a ministry of, of well, a commissariat of defense to, to run it, and a general, we'll create a general staff to do the thinking about it. They do that. Um, but it's going to be small. We'll keep a small standing army, and we'll, have a, we'll still have the National Guard, the territorial militia. That, that'll be big. We'll really rely on that. That will be the, the safeguard against the, the military becoming a Praetorian Guard and taking over, right? Because there was always, uh, really all the way through World War II, um, well, even as long as Stalin's alive, let's say that, uh, a, a, a manifest distrust of the military, okay? Of military institutions in general, because Marxism says to be, but also just, they, they just didn't even trust their own army, it's like, you know, guys in uniform have their institutional powers and they get their own ethos and um, organization. They start to identify with their organization rather than the country, with the state. And so they just 
were afraid that might happen with, with their own army. So, uh, so they have a political administration to keep an eye on them. They have commissars and, and the secret police were embedded in the military as well. Uh, so there, the point is that there was always an uncomfortable relationship between the party and the army, okay? uh, which is going to you know, kind of get in the way of them being a, a better army, the best army they can be. Okay? Uh, but uh, so it's always this contest, this discomfort between the civilians and the military in the Soviet Union, okay? ba really based on um, ideology. Okay? Um, well, the first thing we talked about was the thing. The first thing they got right was how to organize a war. Okay, uh, but not in the normal way. The normal way being that the bourgeois capitalist way. How, how is a, a socialist country going to prepare for war? Okay, and the idea they came up with, I shouldn't say they came up with, but we have the unified military doctrine. Okay, um, and this guy on the right here, um, Mikhail Fruns, uh, I have creator of it in quotation marks because actually he, uh, uh, borrowed it from the Tsarist army. Okay. Now the Tsarist army didn't actually adopt a unified military doctrine, but they started the idea of it, and they had talked about it. Okay. Let me talk about Fruins just a minute here, uh, to kind of stage of what's going on in, in the Red Army. So he was not a soldier before the war, uh, before, the, before the revolution. He was a, a worker and a revolutionary. No, no real military background, uh, no military education, no general staff studies, no um, corps cadets, nothing like that. But he fought during the Civil War in the, in the Red Army, learned as he went along, and loved it. He just loved the military, loved Army life, and educated himself on the strategic thinking, strategic, the organizations of the military, military thought from the Tsarist era, and of foreign countries. So self-educated, just dove into it, and really got on top of it. He, he, uh, uh, and, and committed to being a leader in the military. Uh, and uh, he, eventually he's gonna become the, uh, well, he'll, be, he'll, be, he'll become, in 1925, briefly, the Commissar of War, okay? Uh, and, but he, he's, he's one of these guys who's, who's, who's a, a true guide in the wool Bolshevik, who's willing to sacrifice the ideology, like for a pragmatic, like, no, actually countries need armies, <laughs> even socialist countries who are committed to, to Marxism. We need to have regular standing armies and I wanna be in charge of that. I wanna run that and make it a better, bigger, most, more efficient army along Marxist lines, okay? We can have a, a Marxist army is gonna be a different army, a, a proletarian army, a, a proletarian way of war is gonna be different and better than the capitalist way of war. And he's gonna figure that out. So he's gonna uh, take the ideas of, of, of the old Tsarist army and update them with modern Marxist practices. And we'll put that up in just a minute. Um, well, at the time, he's up against Leon Trotsky, right? who actually is the one who created the Red Army to fight the Civil War. Uh, and, and even more of, of an ideologue than Fruins is, is Trotsky, but even he, like, yeah, we, we gotta have a real army. Uh, he didn't really study how the old army worked and their ideas, but he created the Red Army under a crisis situation and he was a great organizer. He really put that army together, held it together, and inspired it during the Civil War, so he thought he was pretty hot stuff. Um, but he, he, was, he, he never got involved in the ideas of strategy and tactics. So he was kind of, that was a big blank spot for him, and, and Fruins like filled that in already. But he was against the idea of having any kind of a doctrine. It's like, uh, we need the, the officers in command of units to have freedom of action to do whatever they want, and the idea of a doctrine is like, well, here's rules, follow them, make, make them apply to the situation. Without that, you know, we can't fight a war like that, okay? Uh, and that was a real misappreciation because with doctrine isn't a bunch of rules, it's, it's, it's principles that, that you use to guide your thinking about how to fight, okay? So um, this was, became a very political battle between the two. Uh, fought be, uh, in, the, in the party, the political arena, that party conferences and congresses trying to make their point. Uh, and you know, all the time Fruins is trying to make his point for his doctrine, 
he's really trying to get Trotsky's job and, and get allies in the party who don't like Trotsky to back him, even if they don't like or understand his doctrine, just use it to vote Trotsky out. And he wins. He actually, uh, well, he, he gets to be deputy commissar to Trotsky in 24, and then uh, through party machinations, eases Trotsky out. And now he's in charge, and he can do the unified military doctrine. So let's talk about that. Because uh, this is very political. He, he wants it to be um, uh, a new, better way of war. War that, uh, here, I mean, you can read it for yourself, but um, unify everything. And that's what the unified means. It's like we're going to get every aspect of society, politics, government, military on the same suit of music to support each other in being ready to defend the socialist state or attack the rest of the world and create world revolution. Really, Europe is kind of what they had in mind there. Okay. Um, one of the more important parts of this, here we go. Okay. So unity of civilian and military leadership is really acknowledging that the Communist Party is in charge. They make policy. Okay? Uh, they make policy for the military. Because this is national level stuff. Okay? But the military has to be part of making that policy too. Okay? The, the, the party needs to be in charge of because civilian leadership, that's important so that we don't have the army trying to take over. They're all afraid of that. Okay? Um, but also the parties in charge of ideology. We want to make sure we're doing this the Marxist way, whatever that might be, which is, was often quite situational. Like, you know, what would Marx do? Like, oh, well, we'll just make it, we'll just say this sort of conforms to his idea. So, uh, but getting those two together, people who make policy, people who need to have policy made for them on the same sheet of music, obviously is, is going to be a more effective way of waging war or preparing for war. So unity and economic and military development, right? Well, I, I, I get a quote for that. Um, when he's talking about the, his, a quote from Fru says, in any new undertaking, economic, cultural, or other, one must always ask the question, what relation does this undertaking have to the task of protecting the nation? Is there any possible possibility of letting it serve specific military purposes as well without impairing peaceful goals? That is, he wants, because this is going to be a planned economy. It's a socialist economy, a government runs the economy. He wants to plant the idea and have the Commissar of Defense back this up all the time that whatever's going on in the economy, we need to find a way for that to help the military. All right. They, don't, they didn't have the word military industrial complex, but that's what's in, that's really what he's talking about. So military development and economic development need to be mutually um, reinforcing. Okay. Uh, which normally people do, do creating, uh, so, well, developing the economy, they don't really think about, well, how does this affect the military? And Prunes is saying, military needs to be involved at every step to make sure we, our voice is heard and we find a way to kind of push things to help, to help us, to help, to help our in interest on that. Okay? Um, unity of party, state, and society. This is really, um, we'll talk about the society aspect here. Uh, one of the, the lessons that everybody took from World War I was that the Russian people had not got behind the war. They did not support the Tsar, did not support the war aims. Um, it's just very, very weak support all the way around. So we don't want that to happen again. So the party, through ideology, through the party organization, through propaganda, through the education system, needed to, at, in peacetime, it, as well as war, but starting in peacetime, get the people to look at the military favorably, okay, to, appreciate, to pump it up, propagandize it, the army's good, you should want to be part of it, whatever the army's doing, you should support that. Um, in peacetime, so when a war happens, you, they're already conditioned to support military operations and whatever sacrifice it might take. So that's the party's job. So to maybe manipulate might be one word to, way to put it, but just massage or psychologically prepare the people to accept the military, be part of it, um, support it in peace and war. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, don't wait till a war happens to get the, the people behind the army to start that now, and that's the party's job through political education uh, and the state, the education systems, because you're part of that as well. Um, class warfare in the rear of the man. This is something ex expressly and uniquely Bolshevik that uh, Fruns brings to warfare. Okay. That is, um, I should, I don't know if you're, they have an organization in, in Russia called the Common Turn, the Communist International at the time, which was uh, as an or organization based in Moscow where every communist party in the world had representatives. And they took orders from Moscow to coordinate the activities of communist parties in their country. The American Communist Party had a representative, the German, every country has representatives. Okay. So how this relates to warfare is if Russia was going to go to war with somebody, a co country, they would use this organization, the common turn, to organize that country's communist party to disrupt that country internally through, um, uh, through, through the trade unions, have them strike, um, have riots, uh, create political dissent. If it's a legal communist party, and many countries have legal, you know, have them disrupt the political uh, process in their parliaments or in the elective process to destabilize the rear. So when the communist army attacks, the Russian army attacks, it is hard for them to defend themselves. Okay? And they actually did this in the war with Poland in 1920. They, the Comintern whipped up all kinds of um, anti-government feelings and behavior in Poland, actually also elsewhere in Europe where, for instance, they, they got the trade unions to strike and not load ships of supplies from England to go to Poland or not have those supplies unloaded in Poland. They got the, the longshoremen to strike. That's what he's talking about. Use ideology and organization to weaken the enemy in the rear. Okay? And it's strictly Marxist, strictly communist. So that will make, you know, it's kind of like a force multiplier, make your attack that much easier. Okay, that's the idea on that one. Um, at the same time, he had the uh, this same idea of class warfare. It was understood if the Soviet army did advance into a capitalist country, the capitalists that fall under Russian control would cause trouble for them because that's what capitalists do. They cause trouble for communists. So as part of war planning would be patrolling the rear with the secret police to round up troublemaking capitalists. Okay? That's part of the actual war plan. We follow on forces, the NKVD secret police, you're going to be here, you're going to create concentration camps, you're going to get informers, you're going to round up any, you know, put spies in, in society, just do anything to prevent the capitalists from sabotaging your rear like you're trying to do to their rear areas with your communism. Um, so bringing class warfare into long-term military planning was a unique uh, contribution of, of Prunzis. Okay. The Tsarist government didn't think of that because right, they're not a bunch of communists. So, um, And finally, uh, well, almost finally, um, offensive military doctrine that um, Prunz was just absolutely committed that any war the Soviet Union gets into must be conducted from day one on the attack. If it looks like a war is going to break out, don't wait for the enemy to start it. Just go. Do it. All the operational planning, tactic, strategy needs to be on the attack, offensive. Okay. Uh, and finally, he, he kind of left this as, as an adjunct to the doctrine that war with capitalism in Europe, Western Europe, Central and Western Europe, was inevitable. We have to expect that to happen. That, that's just a given. Therefore, we need to always be preparing and prepared to fight, okay? which makes them have more of a claim on the economics and keep the government you know, behind them and their development. I think he was sincere about it, but, um, and that wasn't particularly unique to him. There was a, a broad swath of Bolshevik Party members who really did believe war with the West was, was inevitable, going to happen. So, um, so they're always preparing, can never stop preparing because that war is going to happen. Okay. Um, 
So um, he starts this, uh, go back to him. Uh, he's already talked about this, and it, it becomes actually official in 1923. They, the, the, the party votes on it. This is a, a military doctrine aspect, but the Communist Party votes, okay, we're behind that. That's what Froon's wants. If the party's behind it and the government's behind it, the economy will be behind it, we're good. Okay. Um, but it doesn't start being made real, start creating bodies in an or, organ, organized form in the military to take this task to become a, from ideas to reality until 1925 when he takes over the Commissar of Defense. Okay. But he's only in the job for like eight months and then he dies. Okay. Um, there's debate on this. I'm, he's dead. There's no debate about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he died of undergoing surgery. Um, I don't, not, not an epidemic, something actually fairly serious. Um, on, died on the operating table. He didn't want to have the surgery. He didn't think it was that important. But Stalin insisted, you, you need to have this operation. Um, and so people think, well, Stalin made him do it so he could, the doctors could kill him. Because anything Stalin's involved in has to be evil. You know, it can't, people can't just die having an operation. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, it was not unusual for Lenin or Trotskyistan to, to tell people, take care of your health. Most of us were really bad about that. Um, and so a lot of people had been ordered to have treatments and surgeries and whatever. So I, I just, just because Stalin is involved somehow, I'm not going to say, well, obviously he was a murderer that early. He's going to be a murderer later for sure. I don't know about that. So. So, but, so he, he's out, and lo and behold, um, this guy takes over, Clement Voroshilov. Okay. Um, here's where things start to get a little, uh, well, they just get to be very Bolshevik here. Um, Voroshilov uh, was a good, I, I, said, I was about to say a good friend of Stalin. It's like, I don't know if anybody was ever a good friend of Stalin. Um, from Stalin's perspective, it's like, yeah, friends. But uh, he was a buddy of his from the Civil War. Again, this, uh, a Bolshevik first, a soldier, Johnny come lately, kind of a, uh, a general wannabe. And now he gets to be a general because Stalin's his, his friend. So he becomes commissar of war uh, in place of Frums. And then this is important uh, because he doesn't know a lot about the military. He thinks he does, and that's the problem, right? A little bit of learning is a dangerous thing. He thought he had learned everything he needed to learn about the military from his participation in the Civil War, okay, which, which they won. So like, hey, validate everything I've done. Um, and so he, he, for someone who doesn't know anything about the military per se, like strategy and tactics and really even organization, uh, he'll learn a little bit about that. He'll have a big staff to kind of take care of stuff like that. He was a very traditional. He's like infantry and cavalry, that's what war is about. Okay. Well, Fruins is like, Okay, yes, of course we need to have that. Maybe not so much with the horses, but anyway. Um, uh, there was a big movement, I, I probably should have mentioned with under Fruins too, that they were, Fruins is all about making the unified military doctrine work, the proletarian way of war work with m technology. It was really all about modern technology. And this is like in, in 1923, it's like we need tanks. You know, tanks are new, we need aircraft and modern communications is really looking forward. We've got to invest very heavily in that sort of stuff. Um, not just infantry with rifles and cavalry, they're sabers, which is kind of what this guy's about. So this causes a rift in the military high command. That, that's never good. You have two kinds of, of officers now at, at, at the highest levels. Traditionalists like Voroshilov, who has Stalin's ear, and he's, he's the boss. He is the boss of the Commissar of Defense until 1940, in, into 1940, almost to the end of 1940. Then he, then he gets fired a little late. Um, uh, and then the more avant-garde people who, who support Fruns, the, the obsession with technology and forward thinking about armor, combined arms warfare. Uh, and so they're gonna be constantly butting heads about, you know, I mean, uh, Vorosil is really kind of complacent. Let's get, just get a whole bunch of guys with rifles and horses and we're good. And they're like, no, <laughs> the future is not that. The future is, is technology. So uh, this is going to be a, become political because it's the Soviet Union. Um, uh, and we'll talk about 
um, some of those, let's talk about the different faction. Okay, well, before we get into that. The one thing that two different factions do have in common is they are super frustrated that the army is so small. Okay, so the, the active army was capped at 548,000. Uh, which was down from like six million during World War I and three million during the Civil War. Okay. Still a pretty big army, okay. Uh, 548,000 uh, in the territorial forces, that, that National Guard is huge, okay. It was always the, the largest, um, well, up, up through 1935, the end of 1935, start of 36. Most people serving in the military were serving in that territorial militia, okay. Uh, and that's what the party ideologues really wanted. They want to have, keep that big, get the regular army small. So the thing the two factions had in common was like, now we've got to bust that. We need to have a big, big standing army and a much smaller territorial militia. Uh, and we need an army with lots of high tech stuff. Maybe not vote a so much into that. Um, and they keep getting rebuffed for the first decade, almost first, from 1918 to 1928. Uh, every time they ask to have the army get bigger and, hey, can we get more new stuff, they're told no. The government, the, the Ministry of Finance, the Commissar of Finance says no. No money for you. Okay? Not even soup. No soup for you. Like, Shut up. Go away. Um, because, uh, so for the first 10 years, they're still using old World War I stuff for a full decade af after the war, end of the war. Uh, because the Soviet economy... Uh, say in 1921, that the industrial economy that makes war materials, among other things, was only producing at 18% capacity because of the devastation from World War I, the, the horrible peace treaty breast of toast, and then the Civil War, and then trying to communize the economy, that was a disaster too, okay? So they didn't end that until 19, in, in middle, well, March of 21, they said we gotta stop this and have a new economic policy and, Make some compromises with market forces and get the capitalists back to teach us how to run stuff, okay? So all the money, any extra money that the government could get their hands on didn't go to the military. It, it went to industrial redevelopment, trying to get back to square one. And they do, they get back to square one in 1928. So 1928, they're back to 1913 levels of production. That's square one, okay? And then the party's like, yay, we're ready to have real socialism again because we're producing at 1913 levels in Russia, an agrarian society of Russia. With plenty of things. Okay. So, but every year, multiple times a year, Voroshilov and, and before that, Frunz, everybody else is like just badgering Stalin, the, the, the commissary to find everybody like, give us more money, give us more money, give us so we can get tanks, so we can get these other things and, and a bigger army. And they're always just stonewalled. No, not yet. But now things are going to change in 1928. Okay. There's going to be some money um, to um, give to the military. So uh, in 1928, they start the five-year plan. This is the, they, they end the market forces. They get, the state is now in charge of all the economy again. They begin to collectivize agriculture to get the peasants uh, under their control, shut, the, shut off the free market in and uh, agriculture and export more grain so they can start building more factories uh, and expand, really expanding the industrial economy beyond 1913 levels, okay? Um, and, but Stalin actually sold this massive in investment program to the party and then to the Soviet people as, partly as a defense measure. And he prophetically said you know, in, in 1928, if we, we've got 10 years to make up or we will be, if we don't cover the, well, basically, we don't equal Europe's economy in 10 years, we're, we could be just overthrown and destroyed. Okay? We're not ready in 10 years. And it's like, well, about right. Um, so uh, by saying that, he kind of opens the door to the military. And the military does start to expand. 1928, they got like 617,000 men. Uh, in 1932, they're up to 700,000. Uh, by the end of 35, they're at 900, um, 930,000. Uh, by 1937, they're at a million okay, in peacetime. Okay, they're doing all this. Um, but the most important part of the five-year plan was the massive investment 
in the military industrial complex that Prunes had been arguing for before, before he died. Okay. So they don't actually make a lot of tanks in 19, between 1928 and 1932. But they make a lot of tank factories. They make a lot of aircraft factories, artillery factories, rifles, machine guns. They make the, those factories. So after 1932, they start cranking stuff out. Then they start making machine guns and artillery and tanks by the thousands and tens of thousands and, and millions of rifles. So um, that, that's I think the unified military doctrine is kind of coming together. Army working with the party, working with the policymakers and the economy, get get what they think they need um, for defense. I'm going to show that right now. So, um, so they while they're doing this, well, I'm going to so, oh, wait. Let me get this quick. So they haven't talked about the part. That, so they got that right. The other thing they get right is how to fight the war. So again, there's two ways of thinking about the next war. Well, there was only one. Fruz's idea was like, attack. That's all we do. We just attack. We're on the offense all the time. But um, this other guy down here, Alexander Svetchin, former Tsarist officer, uh, far right corner, is like, attacking is good. Of course we want to attack. That's how you win a war, basically. I don't have a quote on that, but you get it. That's how you win a war. Okay. Um, but, you know, defense is important. You can't always be attacked. Sometimes they're going to attack you, whether you're ready for it or not, and mm -hmm. you got to be ready to handle that. Okay. And, and what he's really getting at is the active defense, okay. not the static defense. The Maginot line, trenches, like, that's static. You just sit in one place and hope they don't break through. Active defense issue actually it, it involves maneuvering in, in the face of the enemy, giving ground, attri attrition, moving until they're finally so weak, then you go on the attack. So that's what he's about. That's what he's like. We need to incorporate that into our doctrinal thinking, prepare ourselves with the right equipment, and practice that. Right? We're, we're so fixated on attacking, if sometimes that doesn't work and, and we get attacked and we have to back up, we won't know what the you know, it'd be psychologically disorienting. It's like, oh, we never thought about having to run away to a better position and regroup. Like, and uh, that did not go over very well. The attacking thing, people like that. Okay. Um, and so he was really opposed officially at first by Georgi Isserson. It's like, no, no, we should, Bruce was right. Attack, attack, attack. That's what we should always be oriented to our thinking, our equipment, our organization. It's just about attack. So that was unresolved, except, uh, again, anyway, it's really the attacking is, people agree, that, that's what we're going to do. Okay. And, and they, they didn't put a lot of men, mental effort into, well, what if? You know, Spencer wrote a lot, well, here's what we do, what if, but it, it didn't get a lot of traction. People don't want to hear that. Because that's, that's sort of defeatist. What, you mean we're not going to win all the time? That, that type of thing. Um, but it worked in 1812, if you know how that worked out. Napoleon attacks, a strategic retreat. If, you, you all know that, right? That's exactly what he's arguing. Like, well, it worked back in 1812. You know, we weren't, the Russian army wasn't ready to attack. We retreated. We, Napoleon got weaker and weaker. We got reserves. We got trained up and equipment. We attacked back. That's what we should be prepared to do. And these guys are like, well, that was then. Now, that's, uh, now we're Bolsheviks. <laughs> okay, so it's different. Uh, it'll work just fine, however we think. Um, so, and uh, but Oshilov is on that on that side too about attack with your cavalry and infantry. Okay. Um, so, in the field regulations of 1929, they they enshrine the the offensive. So, I got the the, uh, the quote from that. It is the task of all combat to inflict defeat on the enemy. But only a decisive offensive in the decisive sector, culminating in persistent pursuit, leads to the complete destruction of the enemy's forces and resources. Defense can only weaken an enemy, but not destroy him. In order to inflict on the enemy a decisive defeat, it is necessary to endeavor to conclude a defensive battle with a switch at the propitious moment to the offensive. Okay. Well, that's kind of like Svetchen is saying, at the propitious moment you switch to, to the offensive, but 
they, they just like threw that in there to make somebody happy, but they were like, we're not even gonna practice that, we're not gonna talk about it, we're just gonna be about the offense. Okay, and that's official textbook stuff we're gonna, we're gonna train on. Okay. Uh, well then, uh, Isterson dies in, uh, no he doesn't, so some, who else does? Somebody died. Yeah. 1976, that's not Okay, um, he, he and Spencer both kind of recede from the, from the picture and are, kind of superseded by this guy, uh, Tukhachevsky, who gets a lot of press. He's, he's like the darling of, of the Red Army, uh, not actually charismatic at all, but a real political player, right? He really played politics, got in with Stalin, and was always arguing his case uh, with the Central Committee for the military. Uh, and he kind of brings the army up along with Krem de Pillo, where's he? Yeah. Yeah, somebody I don't have on here, another guy, Krem de Pillo. I couldn't find a picture of him. Um, they come up with the idea of deep battle. Okay. And this is like right in 1930, 1931. Okay. Um, deep battle, deep operations is what they want to do. So, using combined arms forces, so infantry, armor, artillery, uh, benefit the enemy front, drive deep into the rear, disrupting command, communications, logistics, and setting the enemy up for a certain ultimate disruption. Does that sound familiar? Anybody? Who else thought in those terms? Anybody? Not yeah, yeah, the Germans. It's like, this is the, the Blitzkrieg, okay? Uh, but the, the Germans came up with it simultaneously, but also suspiciously. Um, that they're, they're thinking, and, uh, but they have uh, Charles de Gaulle's thinking about this. You have people in Britain thinking about this. This is kind of the thing. People like uh, the armies across the, the Western world were like, uh, let's not do World War I again. <laughs> let's find a way to win and fight quickly without this long, drawn out trans warfare. So, obviously, armor, tactical air power, movement, that's what we want to do. So, everyone's thinking along the same lines, but it just so happens. One of the reasons the Soviets come up is they were working with the Nazis. Well, they were the Germans. They didn't see Hitler ends the same when he takes over in 33. Between the wars, the German army illegally, because the Treaty of Versailles says you can't do anything, um, they had off, they had secret bases in Russia to develop armor, the actual physical tanks, but also doctrine, chemical warfare, test our artillery, and tactical aircraft. Uh, and the Soviets are working with them and learning from them. They actually have exchanges of officers between their general staffs. For uh, some German general staff officers to come and teach at, at the Russian General Staff Academy, and Russian officers did not teach in Germany because like, you can't teach Germans in. Um, not okay, you can. Um, they attended courses at, at the German Staff Academy, so there's a lot of exchange of ideas. Uh, about development developments during the 1920s and 30s. So sure, they're gonna, gonna kind of come up with the same thing. So, uh, but Tuchachevsky, Tuchachevsky is one who's gonna really push this, but he's not alone, he's got uh, support for this. But he's still obstructed by Boris Shilov. It's like, what's all this with the movement and stuff? It's like, hey, so it's like let's, let's not get too fancy here. And, and Tuchachevsky's like, let's get very fancy here. You know, that's how we're gonna win the next war. So again, we have these two factions, the traditionalists who don't really know a whole lot about the military and these up and coming guys who want to experiment and get down the road. Um, but they do get that right. They do finally adopt this, this deep battle uh, uh, idea and it becomes part of the field regulations of 1936. That deep battle, the combined arms warfare is what we're gonna do. To win the next, we're going to attack somebody. Fine, let's do that. But this is how we're going to do it: with aircraft, working with tanks, with motorized infantry, um, motorized artillery, keeping up, moving fast, encircling the army, getting into the rear. Uh, so, yeah, they, they got that right. They got the, universe, the, the, the the unity aspects right. They got this doctrine thing attacked right. Um, and while they're doing it, and, and they've, they've built the capacity now to make all these aircraft. When they talked about this offensive and 
combined arms in the 20s, it was just talk. They don't have any tanks to work with, but now they do. Uh, and I'm sure that is just uh, with the five-year plans and whatnot. Um, they threw a lot of money into R&D. And these, these guys just went nuts. And it is like, how about, you know, how many turrets can we stick on a tank? I don't know. <laughs> uh, we can stick a lot. I, like, some of them had like five different turrets uh, on them. Like, um, and they did. So, of course, the war winner is going to be the T-34. And that starts way back in the uh, early 30s. And then you can see the development there. But they, I don't have all of them. I couldn't find pictures of everything. There were still like another dozen. Um, I'm not maybe exaggerating, maybe like five or six more models they were they were toying with, um, yeah, because why not? <laughs> they were really throwing money at them, and like they were serious about it. So they were innovative, experimental, um, with all, and, and they wasted a lot of money too, but the government money. So um, it's, the, it's the people's money thing. Okay, so the, the third thing they got right was who are they going to fight? Turkachevsky again, as De Deputy Commissar of Defense in 1928, um, sat down and wrote a, like a, a threat assessment to, uh, to Soviet Union. Since 1928, so as they're doing the five-year plan and starting to gear up this production and stuff. Uh, so he, he divided the USSR's most realistic potential enemies into two camps. The, the first and most threatening was a potential coalition of Great Britain, France, all the Soviet Union's uh, neighbors, Poland, Romania, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and fascist Italy, that they, they could all get together and attack us. Okay, that, he gives that to Stalin. Stalin wrote in the margin, I've seen it, it's like, WTF? What? <laughs> the French? <laughs> I don't know. Ah. 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 Uh, but, but Stalin is like, he actually wrote like, I think he actually wrote like, this is crazy. This is crazy crap. Oh, I forget that. Um, then he, the, the, so the second most threatening group would possibly be Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Greece, Belgium, Japan, and the United States, any or all of whom might find a pretext to attack or join in a war against the Soviet Union. So it, it's like, is he serious about this, or is he just trying to up the defense budget? Okay. But he certainly didn't have a whole lot of credibility in, in 1928 with that. But they still got the money, and they still won. But, um, of course, in the end, there is a coalition of Germany, Hungary, um, the Balkans, Finland, Hungary, who else? Romania. They, they do Italy, fascist. They, they do attacks so. on. In 1941, it is serious, but not in 1928. Okay. Um, but in the middle of this, we get some. Well, okay, so well, here, here's, here's the map. Line. So here you go. Um, he, he said, "Okay, everybody we have a border with." will probably team up and attack us. Even people we don't. Czechoslovakia, Germany, Italy, Great Britain, and France, and the United States, of course. You know, like, they're all going to come us. OK. There you go. Um, in the middle of this, then, we get uh, where are we going? something completely different. Um, this guy, General uh, Ivorov, came up <coughs> with something different. We need a static defense just like the French have a Maginot Line. We should have that. Which doesn't fit anything. It doesn't fit the unified military thing. It doesn't fit the uh, idea of the offensive. It doesn't fit the idea of, of active defense. It's just like, let's put money in, into border protection. And so, why not? They throw millions and millions of rubles and start doing that in, in the 30s. Um, this is it right here. It's to stop the Stalin line. You can see it's not an actual line like the Maginot Line. It's a, a series of uh, fortified regions. But then it's intended to act like the, the Maginot Line, uh, protect uh, violent areas and channel any attacker into areas where they, they would be at a disadvantage and the Soviets would be at an advantage. So they're just kind of throwing all kinds of things against the wall, seeing what sticks. But, but this is money. And the, the guys with the offense, they hated this, because like, it's taking money away from them to put into static. Um, and you'll see this line here, this is the, the, the Molotov line, will be created in 1939 through well, the start of, and really in 40 after they conquered Poland and divided it between, uh, between themselves and Nazi Germany. Okay. Um, so there's that going on as well. We'll come back to that in just a minute. I guess 
start wrapping this up. We're, 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 we're good to eight, right? Nine thirty. Essential pun, I think. Seven ish. I'm on the last page. We're good. Um, the last thing they get involved in here is uh, if I have a map of this. They actually start planning. Okay, if somebody from the west attacks us, where do, are they probably going to come? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Has it. Okay, um, this area here is called the, the uh, Pripyat Marshes. So very marshy. You can't drive tanks through there or infantry. It's just you got to go around. So their defensive plans were uh, to defend with most of their troops either north or south. Okay. So the general staff says the Germans are going to come north. They're going to come on the north side and try to get. Well, our coalition of enemies. They're going to try to get Leningrad and Moscow. So they're going to come this way, shortest route. And Stalin's like, no, they're going to come down here and try to get uh, for, for economic reasons. Because this is where the breadbasket is. There's also coal, a lot of, a lot of industry, uh, food, yeah, food, coal, oil down here. They're going to come that way. So Stalin insisted that they, they put most of the troops down here. Okay. Now, um, in the end, which, which, anyway, no, which, which ways did the Germans come? Both. Both. They went both. Okay. But they had, the Soviets had more out of position than before. Okay. But that, that's going to be a little bit um, less important when we get to the end right now. Okay, so here we are in 1936. Um, and they're in a great position. They've got 11,000 tanks. They've got more tanks than the rest of the world. I don't know how many aircraft they have, but they have a lot of aircraft. The first rate, they're still biplanes, but everybody has biplanes still. Okay. They've got a big an army of uh, almost a million. They're in really good shape. They've got the right ideas, mostly. Okay. Uh, now there's the contest of which one's going to go into effect. They don't have any armored divisions. They have a lot of that. Those 11,000 tanks they have are actually divided amongst to support the infantry. They're in, in brigades and regiments. They're not all together as armored divisions. They're, they're, People who want that, but Boris Yeltsin says no, we're not doing that. He didn't want it. Okay. Other than that, they, they got they got it all right. But then, so how how do things grow? How do we end up with how do we end up with this with that um, and, and the Germans on the gates of, of Moscow in December and on the and the Volga the next year? How does that happen? What what the hell went wrong? That's what everybody really starts the Soviet you know, the history of the Soviet Army in the thirties. They start. Let's just start with this. What, there we go. So everybody understands we had the purges, right? Uh, well, I shouldn't say everybody, some of you don't know. But there was a massive purge uh, of the military. That's it. It's not even that massive. I mean, my claim to fame is I wrote a book on why the purges aren't that big a deal. But anyway, um, they the, an officer corps had about 100,000 guys. They purged about 20, well, 12,000 guys were purged. That is, um, demoted, f well, actually fired, expelled from the military, or arrested, sent to the gulag, or executed. A lot of the top um, guys, anybody killed in 37, 38, you know, uh, took a Svetchin and took a Chesky. Um, yeah. so Svetchin was uh, executed in 38, took a Chesky in 37. A lot of the big thinkers, uh, Igor, yeah, he was actually uh, killed in 1930. And part of the purchase is it took a while to get around to shooting him. Um, so they, they uh, really the, the top 12 guys in the Air Force and the Army were executed. Okay? Then a bunch of other generals, colonels, but really a lot of lieutenants and captains were executed or dismissed. Uh, at one point, like 20,000 guys were gone, but they brought 8,000 back. Okay? They rehabilitated, put back in the Army, and back, back in business as usual. So um, out of 100,000, know, they lost 12,000. That's not good, okay? um, but not as crippling as they wanted uh, to make out. Okay. What probably more, I think more important was the rapid expansion. They went from a million in 37 to five million in 41. Five million guys. That's a lot of new recruits. And you need a lot of leadership to run that. 
and they couldn't recruit people to do that. At the time the war breaks out, they're short 200,000 officers. They, 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 they need 200,000 more platoon leaders and, or company commanders. That they, they don't have them. They just don't have them. Okay. So when you lose 12,000 to the purges, but you're short 200,000, you can't say, well, they lost. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> they created jobs for people that didn't show up to take them. People didn't want to be army officers. So that was a war. So uh, they were making people be officers, officers that they did have. And they did add a lot of officers, but with very short training. Um, so they just weren't ready in time. Right? So it's a vast, tremendous leadership gap um, that they hadn't been able to make up. And they have no organized reserve force. And you might be thinking, wait, wait a minute, Dr. Reeves, you just said they had this huge territorial militia, which was their National Guard. Well, after 1936, the, the, the regular army guys got their way. They abolished that and turn, the, turn those units into regular units. So they had no reserve. So if you have a war, you need to expand your army. You don't have a base to do that. You have to start from scratch. Get 18,000 guys together in a big field. So, okay, you are now a, a division. <laughs> Figure that out. Uh, oh, wait, we don't have, we had units before we could have put you into, and that they no, don't exist anymore. So uh, that, that was something they didn't, in 36, they did. They had a huge reserve they could have expanded with, with cadre, equipment, and, and a base of operations. They, 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 they denied themselves that. After. They can't, can't blame the purges for that, because Tukhachevsky was a, a, trying to do that his whole time. If he had survived, he still would have done that. So that, that was a problem. Uh, incorrect disposition of forces. So let's go back. Uh, we had that north-south thing we talked about. But worse than that, okay, they, they, they abandoned this line, which is fairly deep in the rest. It's like the Germans would be more spread out to where they're going, and you could, you could have defended here. But when in 1939, when they took over Poland, they you know, split it with Germany, Nazi Germany. They took all the equipment, the the, the guns and the ammunition and the communication stuff, out of here, out of Stalin, and moved it here. And be, before they had actually finished building it, they started making bunkers. Also, and they hadn't finished it when the Germans attacked. So when they're falling back on some of these abandoned positions, they have nothing to work with. And, and they just, you know, they just kept falling back. You know, which way do we take our forces? Which way are the Germans coming? Oh, they're coming to the north. Oh, they're coming to the south. We don't know what. So um, they, they didn't get that right in 1939, 1941. And they just flat out underestimated the that, that they could attack both north and south of the Pripyat marshes, go for the Ukraine, and go for Moscow, and go for Nazi Germany, uh, go, go for, for Leningrad. So back to the where I started, it didn't have to be this way. They, they had thought things through, they had got it right, and then things just started going wrong. Decisions were made. And again, the purchase part of that, it was never really clear about all that. But I mentioned that distrust between the civilians and the military. It was always there, and it, it just boiled over in 37, where Stalin was convinced by other people around him, these guys are up to something. We can't trust them. Nazi Germany is a real threat, and these guys might be in league with them or something going on. So we just got to, uh, for the security, they actually did it for, uh, Stalin actually tells this to the Central Committee, and he believes it. It was a security measure. Eliminating those officers made Russia safer because they were potentially and probably traitors. So again, you know, these things kind of came home to roost. As well. Okay, so I'm done. Oh, no time for questions. Let's go eat. What? <laughs> That's my tactic. I, I, Would you be willing to answer Yes, absolutely. I said use that term. It was just like thinking ahead of time that the concept of total war, mm -hmm. but also in peace. Be preparing for total war, like total peace mm -hmm. development and all that. Absolutely. 
So the class warfare in the rear of the enemy, all those things you talk about sound suspiciously like what goes in that, on in this country today. It is. That, that the rest is how to warfare. But instead of using the Communist Party, they're using social media. To, I mean, rest of, you know, to, to create dissent, dissension, and distrust. I mean, they're a, not just against us, they're doing it all across Europe to make those governments more susceptible to Soviet, or I'm sorry, Russian aggression, of whether it's diplomatic or potentially military. Absolutely. You've written extensively about the winter war with Finland. Didn't that put a break on the Red Army? Uh, actually, the war with Finland in so November 30th, 1940, I'm sorry, 1939 to March 12th, 1940, was when all these problems start showing up. When they don't have competent leadership, don't have enough leadership at the, at the junior level, all of a sudden it's like, the Nazis took note of that. It's like, hmm, these guys aren't performing real well against the Finns. Uh, very, very poor planning, uh, overestimating themselves, underestimating their enemy. Uh, the, the Finns had their version of the Maginot Line, held the, Ma the Mannerheim Line, and the Soviets didn't even know about it until they were just massacred. So very poor military intelligence, you know, so they, uh, yeah, well, way, way overestimated themselves. We're a big army, therefore, we should win. That type of thing. And, and uh, it's, it, I'll thank you for asking that, because it helps me, like, this was just, just how the thinking was in, in like, Voroshilov and these traditionalists, is when they had, they had an after action conference about the Winter War, it's like, what went wrong? And Voroshilov and, and Stalin's buddies from the Civil War said, oh, well, we didn't use enough cavalry. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, you've executed the guys who like this combined armed warfare church. <laughs> That's what we should be doing. So, uh, but actually, Voroshilov got fired as a result of that war. A little bit late bringing guys up who, who did think in terms of modern warfare. So politics plays in. If you're in with Stalin, you can put it breaks on a lot of things, a lot of good things. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know if you're planning on talking about any of this. In Whatever future, you want me to ask. But um, political officers in, or political agents in every unit, at every level, that, that really had more power than the regular officers. You had units whose job was to execute anybody who retreated. And that's actually not true. I wrote about that. Really? But they wanted the soldiers to think that, so why not? Right. And then, I guess, ultimately, what happened to all the POWs, the, German, the Russians that were taken as POWs during the war, what happened to them okay, so I'll talk when about, they were liberated? Yeah, let's talk about those two things. So one is, they, they, were, they had a huge political administration to keep an eye on the military. We talked about that because like, they don't trust the army. So we have commissars who, uh, actually answer to the Communist Party. They are paid by the Communist Party, not by the army. Okay. Um, ostensibly, they were there for, uh, well, during the Civil War, they, they co-commanded. An officer's uh, orders were not official until his commissar signed off on them. Okay. That actually went away in 1925, comes back during the purges. They bring, uh, it was in effect during the war with Finland, and the army uses that, the army hated that, okay. and they finally, Usually they blamed the loss of Finland. Like, well, the commissars were in our way. So they went, took it away. They brought it back again in 42. I'm sorry, se September 41, they bring it back and get rid of it again in 42, finally. Um, so this is back and forth. Like, who's really in charge here? Who's going to get in trouble if this doesn't work out? And actually, commissars got punished along with the commanders so things really didn't work out. But it, it didn't help anything. It just confused the chain of command um, and paralyzed initiative uh, of commanders. So, so that's another problem. How big of a problem was it? On top of everything else, hard to judge, but it certainly it didn't happen in 41. It, it, they brought it back in September, so June, July, August, this the army, you know, on that one. Uh, the other interesting question is about what happened to all the, uh, like, two and a half million Soviet POWs survived the war in German captivity. Like, a million didn't. Uh, maybe 1.2 million didn't survive. Uh, so the, the myth is that they all went directly from liberation by the Red Army when they get to Germany to the Gulag. It, that, that did not happen. What happened was they, all these 
POWs, and all the forced laborers that were taken out of the Soviet Union to work in Germany or Austria, well, in the Third Reich, uh, were filtered as they went into concentration camps in the Soviet Union, in, in the Western part, that were run by the secret police, and that everybody, on an individual basis, their cases were analyzed, they were filtered. Uh, and what they were looking for two things, traitors, people who voluntarily went over to the Germans or let themselves be captured when they should have been fighting, volunteered to work for the Nazis as laborers, whatever, um, but looking for those people, and also looking for um, double agents being fed in by the, the, the capitalists. So, uh, so they went case by case. Everybody's you know, records were, were brought up somewhere they had they, they, uh, interviews. This took a long time, they were every single person. Um, and then if you're clear, and most people were clear, I, I, I don't have the numbers here with me, but of these millions, of, over three million people, probably like more like five million people filtered, um, I think it's like 160,000 were sent to the Gulag, or shot. Like you were a traitor. That's, whereas the Germans actually had documents like they had five times as many people on their payroll. <laughs> and the secret place, like they didn't do a very good job finding those people. So, but there was always a stigma. All, even to this day in, Soviet Union, in, in Russia, if someone had been a POW, they, they are assumed to have, it, it was under dishonorable circumstances. They were officially, re, they were denied veterans benefits. Even if you were cleared and went back to work in the Soviet Union, there's always this cloud. Uh, they were officially cleared by Putin in like 1990s or not, uh, 2000 something. Like, okay, come on, they're all good, everything's fine, and they can have veterans benefits. The handful that are left, but still, it, uh, it, it, it was just yeah, the cloud over there. Uh, in modern times, has there been any political discussion at all for? A volunteer army? As yes. To so the, the civilians, since, since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the civilian governments from Yeltsin through Putin to this day have been pushing for a, a volunteer army, no more conscription. And they keep passing laws saying that's going to happen. They have contracts, so they do have some contract soldiers with the volunteers, whatever. Um, but it hasn't happened, really, because the army doesn't want it to happen. High command wants to be able to draft all the Soviet young men at the drop of a hat. And if they go to a completely volunteer army, the draft system will be decommissioned and they won't have a right to, 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 to look to those guys. They'll have to ask them to come. If they do have a major war and they need to, draft, they have to recreate the whole draft system. Well, they if they have a big Chernobyl, they're going to need to find the soldiers to defend them. It's kind of a power, it's a power play between the military and the civilians. And the military so far, so it's been 30 years, has held the cards. And they, they have prevented Putin from making, from forcing them to go all the way. So, so in the late 30s, you were saying they got rid of the reserve force. If they were trying to build up their industrial capacity earlier on, why would they go and take millions of guys out of the workforce that were in the reserves and put more of a strain on the economy for for funding more soldiers. That's exactly they, what the economists said. <laughs> and, they, and when they actually started to really mobilize up for World War in, in 1940, 41, they, they, the, the factory management and the industrial management, they were screaming. We send our guys back. This is ridiculous. We can't make the tanks you want by taking these guys. And, and, and they didn't do it very well. That is, they just like, they were drafting all these guys, calling up these reservists out of your tank factories and steel mills or whatever. Instead of taking non-essential guys and, and having like, oh, these guys really should be in a steel mill rather than the army. And just in the, in the weeks before the Germans invaded, they actually thought, yeah, we should probably go through these guys and send some of them back. But it was, it was, it was a civil military conflict. They, 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 they didn't, even though they're, you know, they're unified military, they, was like, there was always tension. Like, whose interests get served? And it, not everybody gets their own way. I have a question. Like in the cooperation between the Germans and the, the Soviets after Rapallo, right? right? There were also an element there were uh, the Germans because they weren't allowed to build airplanes, trains in the Soviet Union and uh, flown planes there, which I assume were also built there, right? Right. Because you couldn't bring them in. Right. I mean, that would be against our time. Um, uh, 
Henkel and Junkers built factories. Right, there were factories there. And so I don't know how come the Soviets were not able to profit from this intellectual capital on that time. They did, so actually. They did profit. Because you just mentioned it wasn't possible for them from the 30s to build. That was, well, the actual aircraft factories were built in the, the, about the same five years plan time. 29 to 31, 32. That's when they, they built those. So they didn't actually really get up and running a lot of oh. planes, but they but they had started building them. Yeah. It takes a while to get a factory up and all their things going. Like that. And they were doing it's really R and D rather than mass production. It's what they were uh -huh. working on at that time. They certainly, the Soviets certainly wanted those factories up and running and mass producing. There's another question. There. Um, so when you talked about, I just kind of looking back at the UFD, at the United military doctrine, you're talking about the idea of using class uh, work for the weak and the enemy from behind. Did, was that actually ever used in any capacity in World War One, or? But it, was, it was used in the Russian Polish War in 1920, but they, they couldn't use it in against the Nazis. So it was like a one-time use? Yeah, and then it, it, it kind of, with the, with the rise of fascism, that kind of, because they, they outlawed communist parties. <laughs> so you don't have that mechanism to, you can't mobilize the communists against your government when all the communist leaders are in jail and all the communist party members are pouring up their party cards. Mm -hmm. So that, they were kind of onto that. What was the role of women in the Red Army? Uh, in 1941, there were uh, there were 1,000 women in the army. Mm -hmm. By the end of the war, there were close to a million. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, mostly on a volunteer basis, but not really. There was a lot of social pressure put on young communists, young cop small members. To come to join, uh, particularly as nurses, communications operators, but uh, there were also frontline troops. Women volunteered to be snipers, machine gunners, infantry. There were three, at least three reg regiments of uh, fighter and bomber pilots, okay. all women, and some mixed units. And, and the Air Force really, like, they did not want those women. And a handful of women went and camped out in this guy's office, and they wouldn't leave. Until he agreed to let them form the squadrons. Could we say that this was unique to the Red Army compared to the rest of the armies at that time? Um, the success of the women in getting in was unique. There's also that they just they just called on Marxism. Marxists were all equal, and that is official policy. Women are equal, so like there you go. Women wanted to serve in the German army. I think that Nazis actually ended up using a bunch of women. But they wanted to serve the American Army and Air Forces. They wanted to serve and all this, and the, the systems were more, and the, and the British were more effective in keeping them out, or, or marginalizing them to non-combat. And then, and then whatever all the valuable um, contributions they made, they just like won't talk about that again. <laughs> so, until until now, finally, a lot of uh, women are getting the recognition they deserve. So, so it was really Marxist ideology that gave the Russian women the, the edge for their argument. But they're, right, Russian men were just as, as sexist as anybody else. Didn't a woman shoot Lenin at one time? Uh, <laughs> Anya, um, oh, um, oh, Fanny Kaplan. She shot him three times. <laughs> <laughs> I don't kill him, though. Yeah. Was yeah. well, she just, kind of blind and possibly yeah. some of the ass shooting helping Yeah, her very nearsighted. Mm -hmm. um, and she didn't use a big enough gun. <laughs> how that works. How strong were the effects of these policies felt, say, 10, 20 years after the war? It seems that, you know, the tradition of saying, oh, more, more infantry, more cavalry, and then all this steel and oil is heading your way, it seems like that would change minds very quickly. Yeah, after, well, they actually did use cavalry a lot during the war, uh, mostly to move guys around really quick where they needed to be rather than the charge. But there were some cavalry charges against the infantry with eh, mixed results. Um, but you know, peasants, you know, got a dime a dozen, we can care about that. But no, immediately after the war, the Red Army went on a, a, a track to become completely mechanized and motorized. That's it. And they still are today. They're probably the first one, to be, well, actually, the American Army originally kind of got there during the war. The Russians used a lot of uh, horses during the war. A lot of horse-drawn artillery and wagons, and they finally made just a capital war. That's it. Horses are gone. Everything's going to be motorized or mechanized. So they, but it wasn't a, a lesson they learned from the war. They guys already knew that. They just were up against a handful of guys who weren't going to 
wasn't going to happen. The idea was already there to do that. All, all those guys who were against all that stuff, they either got killed or fired, demoted during the war. A little late for them. Germany was one of those countries where they were like, eh, they're probably real. Um, why were they like letting Germany build factories in their country and exchanging information with them if it was potentially? No, good question. So the question is like, if, if they had Germany on the, because the list wasn't made until 28, and they started to, they're, in 22 is when they started. But there's always that tension between, between ideology and practicality. And they, and they got it right. So it's like, okay, Germany might want to attack us, but in 1922, they don't have what it takes. Right? The Treaty of Versailles had like eviscerated their entire military, so it's kind of a safe bet. You know, we, we, we can, and, and so it was like, we, we, they, they consciously let their guard down in the 20s to recover the economy rather than put money into the military, because they, they knew nobody could, could attack them at that time. <laughs> but by letting those factories and stuff, weren't they almost like giving them the ability? Yes, they were. Yeah. And even the Nazi Soviet non aggression pact, they both agreed that the Soviets sent the, uh, the Nazi Soviet non aggression pact in 1939, the Soviets sent the German raw materials, uh, manganese, iron ore, what, fer other ferrous materials, oil, coal, all the things Germany needed to make tanks and everything to attack them. And the Germans sent the Soviets heavy machinery to build factories. And, high-tech equipment that they could have used to make tanks to attack them. It's always even this fair. <laughs> all right, um, well, thank you all again for coming. A special thank you to Ms. McWilliams and Ms. Davis, uh, as well as the Modern Languages Department, um, your dedication to your students and your passion for education is what keeps us alive and this allows us to do stuff like this. Um, thank you again to Dr. Reese for coming today and presenting to us. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed your uh, enjoyed the lecture, and I hope that you might be able to take something away from Russian culture and history that you didn't know previously. Thanks again. Thank you.